Hi, Nikita. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you? Good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available in both streaming video on either Blogging Heads TV or Meaning of Life TV, depending on our subject. In this case, it's going to be Blogging Heads TV and on audio podcast. You can search for The Wright Show on a podcast app near you. And you are Nikita Petrov. Uh, and you are in St. Petersburg, Russia. And we're going to talk about Russia uh, right. for reasons I will explain shortly. First, I want to say, uh, by way of full disclosure, you actually do some work for me in the vast Blogging Heads TV, Meaning of Life TV, Mindful Resistance Newsletter, Empire. Um, and in fact, people may have seen you. You've done a few of these yourself. Uh, you did a very uh, widely watched uh, couple of conversations with a critic of Scientology, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what was his name? Tony Ortega. Okay, so people go to YouTube and, and Google his name and yours. They'll see a, a couple of much watched videos. But um, I want to talk about Russia. Uh, and the reason is that, um, you know, the character of Russia in the kind of American mind has been changing. Uh, it's gone through a couple of changes in recent decades. I mean, it was the evil empire, at least according to Ronald Reagan in the 80s. And then the Cold War ended and we warmed up to Russia. Uh, I, I went over there in the early 90s, which, by the way, would have been really hard to do during the Cold War, when I, when, uh, which was before your time. But you just didn't like run into Americans who had been to Russia. Right. You know? um, and for and, Russians, uh, it was virtually impossible to go anywhere outside of the communist bloc. Soviet, Soviet Union, yeah, or the communist bloc more broadly. Um, so uh, uh, so that, that changed. Uh, but then, you know, uh, things started getting colder again. Um, and, and the Trump, the Trump presidency has in a way intensified that, uh, because, you know, because th this Russia collusion story is big among anti-Trumpers, mm -hmm. suddenly we have people on the left who are sometimes depicting Russia as this like nefarious evil thing. Uh, in ways they they might not have in an earlier time, it's no longer an evil empire, and in fact that may be the source of some of the behavior we find evil. In fact, is insecurity over it not being an empire. But we can we can get to all this kind of stuff. The, the I, I just wanted to um, start out by by getting a sense for what it's like to be in Russia. How uh, how repressive and autocratic and horrible is it of course this all assumes uh this all assumes that you can speak freely uh, yeah can and you but and it's one of those things where if you say you can speak freely i don't know whether you're telling the truth whether they're like putin goons in your apartment so like can send me a signal i, I I told my grandmother that I'm going to be recording this interview and she said, well, you just should stay away from politics. And the <laughs> argument that worked for her that, that calmed her down is it's going to be in English. So you shouldn't worry about that. It's not going to be read or listened to by the Russian authorities. My grandmother is a Putin supporter, by the way. So even though she is, well, hey, I have three siblings who voted for Trump. We should put them in touch with each other. <laughs> they could they could be uh, they could join the uh, global ethno nationalist front. Um, the uh, and we should say you've been to uh, anti-Putin demonstrations. You've been, to, I think, you've been to demonstrations in support of this uh, Putin rival Navatsky, who is currently in jail. Navalny, yeah, Navatny. Um, and uh, and then you, you actually, I saw uh, a kind of avant-garde demonstration. I saw your picture on the web as part of this avant-garde demonstration, kind of absurdist demonstration that we'll get to later. Um, I want to I want to uh, start off with more straightforward things like, you know, what you know, you've been to America, you, you spend some time here working for a software company um, for some months, I guess. So you got a sense for how free things are here. How would you describe kind of the degree of your uh, freedom of, you know, political expression and so on? Well, that's a that's a curious question. So I, I've I've lived in America for like a a little more than a year. Uh, 
when I was working there. And before that, uh, I traveled through America. I visited like maybe a third or half of the States uh, on a kind of a road trip. And um, the reason it's a curious question is because you would assume that Russia is a, this oppressive country where people feel less free. In some senses, and I know that I'm not alone in that, in some senses, it's the other way around on like a individual level. And it has to do, I think, with, like there's a saying, there, it's, a, it's an old saying, I think dating back to the 19th century or something. Uh, and it goes, uh, the harshness of Russian law is balanced out by the fact that you don't have to abide by it. And it's kind of true. Like the system... The laws or, or maybe the system generally may be more kind of oppressive on paper, but then when you are interacting, let's say, with an American policeman and with a Russian policeman, my sense, and also not just my sense, but like I looked at how my American friends reacted to when the car was stopped by an American cop, everybody was very, very tense. I was... <laughs> just out of curiosity, what was going on in the car, Nikita? Nothing. It was speeding. It was speed. We speed. Oh, I see. But it's like okay. I was excited because, uh, like, to me, it was like this tourist experience, and the uh, the cops are not like in Russia, and they they the, the the cop woman parked the car like they do in the movies, like uh, s- s- like sideways a little bit. Like it seemed like we are in a car chase, and uh, you know the blinking lights and everything. I took a picture of the cop car from a back seat and the American friends were like, what the fuck are you doing? This, and, and they were very tense. And the woman was very, I was impressed by her because she was very collected and very on point. There was nowhere in the conversation that took place between the driver and the police woman that uh, a bribe could be suggested. To me, all of that was like, this is very efficient, um, but also kind of scary and in uh in because they might actually take you to jail for breaking the law you mean right because you're you when you, you when you do you mean it's always possible to bribe your way out of trouble in russia it's always possible that something is gonna it's always somewhat informal you're interacting with a human uh when a policeman when you're dealing with a policeman you're interacting with a person who has you know depending on how you structure the conversation things may go different ways in America, I felt like when you're talking to a policeman, you're interacting with like a function. Right. And, well, we we refer to that as the rule of law. I right. Think, right. I understand. Where, yeah. where where we do not we, we try not to accord much discretion to people who are not supposed to have discretion. Right. Um, which includes uh, police officers. In theory, they certainly do exercise discretion, but it sounds like they exercise much less than you're accustomed to. Right. So so. But because of that, like, there are rules in America that you should just shouldn't break. And if you break them, you're putting yourself in danger. In Russia, I guess you're kind of in danger low level generally because anything might happen. But then in any situation, you have a kind of degree of freedom where you might talk to the guy and go in and, and you know, figure your way out. You might bribe them. Or you might just, mm-hmm. he, he might be in a good mood. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, my the, the American friends that I had that lived in Russia for some time were very, uh, they, I mean, I didn't agree with them. I do not like Russian cops, but some of them found them endearing because they're like wearing these, uh, the uniform sometimes doesn't fit and they look just kind of bored and walking around and some of them uh, ran into trouble. Not well, actually, didn't r- run into trouble. Like a girl was drinking a beer on the subway because she assumed that in Russia you should pro- you're allowed to drink beer on the subway. That was not the case, but the cop didn't give her any shit. Just went like hide it or you know put the beer yeah. away. And she was well, that could cer- that could certainly happen in America, especially with a foreigner. Right, I think. Um, I mean that that I think that kind of uh, stuff happens somewhat frequently. But tell me if if there's any relationship between what you're talking about and and my experience when I visited uh, Russia with my wife in the early '90s. This was before the Soviet Union had broken up. Uh, Gorbachev uh, was still in power, and one thing I found frustrating, and here was the way I would have described it at the time, but I'm now starting to rethink is that one thing I found uh, frustrating is it seemed that like 
nobody was motivated to do a good job. In other words, like, <laughs> you, you know, like you'd get to this place 15 minutes before it was supposed to close, but like they had decided they were just going to close it. Right. It was just a personal decision. And, and, and I just thought you're not, you're doing a bad job, but, but now I'm starting to, to think, no, it, it wasn't so much that it was that this is a human being. You may be able to interact with them in a way that will get them <laughs> to open it back up or to keep it open for you. But it, they just think of their role differently. It's right. Well, there's been a change. Uh, so you're saying this was before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yeah, I saw this as a I saw this as a legacy of a communist economy where there really isn't that much incentive to do a good job, right? I mean, you got this job; it's the government job. Right. It's like you're going to have this job regardless. And and I certainly think there was a certain amount of just dulled incentives. Yeah. No, uh, I, I I think I think that's a correct. Uh, uh, analysis of what's going on. There was even like in the nineties, I know that, um, you know, when we became capitalist and, and, uh, people started that there uh, was small and medium business. Now, uh, the people opening business often would not hire anybody with experience in customer service. Because that experience was from the Soviet time, and that's not the kind of people they want to interact with customers now when they actually want to run a profitable business. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, that uh, uh, I think you're correct okay, there. So, yeah. so maybe I'm, I'm, I'm maybe I'm wrong to think there was uh, the, to conflate these two things. But but so anyway, uh, I, I'm sure I, 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 you know, I take your point. Cops have more discretion. They're more likely to accept a bribe. Is it is it kind of a, an assumption that basically any cop, if the price is right, could be bought? I think so. That's. I mean, I don't have personal experience with that, uh, mostly because I don't drive. I think. Um, but well, a good uh, the the driving thing, good place to start is most people I know who have a driver's license bought it instead of. Uh, uh, you know, getting it mm. through through the official channels. Wow. So yeah, the corruption in in the in police is very uh, high. So what about um, you know political expression? You you've you've been part of uh, you know demonstrations where you could have been a, could you could have been arrested for being there, right? I mean, I mean, were there were people who arrested just for doing what you were doing or not? Well, I myself was arrested, uh, not. Not arrested, I guess. Detained is the word. Yeah. So it was grabbed by a cop, put in a cop. And I actually have a, I tried to, I had a failed attempt of escaping the cop van. That's actually a good story to um, <laughs> illustrate the same point of how the ineffectiveness of the system may give you a, a higher degree of freedom or, or something. I was grabbed by a cop at uh, one of the first uh, big uh, anti-Putin protests. Um, put into a cop van. It, it was filled with mostly young people for whom it was like the first political rally of their life, their first interaction with with uh, the police in this way. So people were nervous, but they because it was the first of the the series of um, uh, protests, they detained more people that they could handle. So the police uh, offices around Moscow were filled to capacity. And so we were taken from one police office to another to another through Moscow traffic jams uh, on, on, on the after, in the afternoon. And so it just took a very long time to get to the police station. And the initial nervousness of the crowd kind of subsued and people just started chatting, joking about things. And I was standing in the back of this van right in front of the door and I wasn't really paying attention to the conversation that was going on, but somebody said jokingly, maybe, and we were standing in a traffic jam, so the, the van mm -hmm. was uh, was not moving. And somebody said jokingly, maybe it's like in ordinary buses, like there's a button here, maybe if I press it, <laughs> they let us go. And somebody else jokingly pressed the button, and then the door did open. <laughs> I mean, you talk about something that would not happen in the United States. I suppose I can imagine an emergency such that they were using vehicles that weren't really designed for it. But 
That's kind of mind blowing. I mean, was that so? That was not like a real police, like what we would call a paddy wagon. That was just some kind of vehicle common. No, it, for the it purpose. was it was a police, yeah, paddy wagon. Uh, I think they were just like I think the driver just was wasn't paying attention. You know, like so. <laughs> when, so did you get out? Did you get out? Well, since I didn't wasn't paying attention to the conversation, I thought we got to the police station. <laughs> <laughs> so I just stepped out and kind of waited, like, what's next? And then I saw, like, five people run uh, away from the from the paddy wagon. And I did, like, after a, a pause, I made an attempt to run, too. I actually made a pretty good distance uh, away from the cop. But for whatever reason, I mean, it's like uh, you're running away from the cops. You're nervous. I wasn't uh, – anyway, I thought – I should split. You'd be, you'd be more nervous in the United States, believe me. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so I thought that a good strategy would be to split with the group, uh, and then maybe the the cop will chase the group instead of myself. The cop did chase me, and though I made a pretty good distance away from the cop, I, the turn that I made was led to a dead end. So I just ran into a dead end and then waited for like another minute for the cop to catch up with me. Then he grabbed me, took me back to the street. So he didn't like rough you up at all? I think, see, back to this point of cops being human, like there was this minute where I'm waiting for him to catch up with me. I'm not running away anymore (laughs) anymore because there's nowhere to run. And I think that minute like calmed him down. Like he was angry while he was running after me. And then by the time he actually approached me, he's like, what the fuck are you doing? I was like, I thought I could run away. And so he just grabbed me by the shoulder, brought me back to the street. The police wagon left by that time. They didn't wait for us. <laughs> and so he, he talked on the walkie-talkie. He said, where are you? They said, we're in a traffic jam like 20 meters to 200 meters away from you. And so we walked through the traffic jam to the police wagon. And then the cop in that, in the paddy wagon said, where are the rest? And the cop that got me said, he, he was the one, he was, he was the only one who ran away. He was the only one stupid enough to get caught. But so, so in that, in the, even in that small exchange, the one cop told to the other, told the other cop, he lied that I was the only one who ran. Oh, I see. I see. So yeah. The so did, 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 did just, the cop did the cop have a gun? The cop who was chasing you? They don't usually carry gun. I mean, oh, some, I see. Some well, do. that does take the pressure off. Yeah. Well, I mean, also the population doesn't have guns, so I I kind of understand the yeah the they don't need in them. America. Yeah. I I think I might settle for that trade off uh, personally, <laughs> but I digress. Um, the uh, okay, so that was your adventure at a. <laughs> at a political demonstration. Right. So the answer is, yeah, you can be arrested uh, by attending uh, for attending a political rally. Um, most of the time, it's not serious. So I was brought back. I got a. I spent a night in the police office uh, and went to court. And of the group that was with me, uh, that were arrested at the same at the same spot, it was random. Some people got five days. Some people got ten days. Some people got fifteen days. I got a fine of a thousand rubles, which is in today's currency, like fifteen dollars or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so like a parking ticket. Yeah. So, um, what, what, what? You've been to America. What kinds of things do you would you feel free to do in America that you would really hesitate to do in Russia? By the way of uh, in, political expression, if any. Um. I actually attended a couple of rallies in America, just out of curiosity. So I lived in Houston when um, this whole wave of protests after Ferguson started happening. Mm, mm. And so I went uh, to a couple of those, and it is a different feeling. The Russian political rallies, most of them, unless it's like nationalists protesting after one of them was killed or something like that, if it's your your usual like anti-Putin rally... It's very calm. People are pretty orderly. People are not. Um, it, it's just generally more people. People are cautious. In America, uh, the crowd is way livelier, chanting way louder, offending police officers, um, uh, yelling at them. I wouldn't do that in Russia. 
Uh, I wouldn't yell in the, in the face of a police officer. I would definitely be arrested at that moment. Um, mm -hmm. I would not block streets uh, like um, roads during a political demonstration, which uh, has happened in, in, in a couple of those uh, that I saw in Houston. Mm -hmm. um, generally, I wouldn't confront the police in any way, really, during a political rally. Mm -hmm. when, uh, when people are grabbed at a political rally in Russia, um, few people attempt like getting your guy out of the hands of the cops. Because then nobody's going to rush to your aid. Like they might, but mostly people would mm -hmm. boo the cop or something. Um, so it's, it's, yeah. So what about written expression or, you know, using the internet to write things about Putin or to do like a, you know, a, a podcast or whatever? Um, I mean, first of all, is, is internet, I assume internet access is now widespread enough so that, uh, there could threat things that Putin deemed threatening could certainly happen that way. Right. Like you could put something on the internet that would get a lot of, uh, traffic and, uh, it would be bad for him. Sure. That's the, um, that's the beginning of, uh, Navalny's career, who is now like the biggest, uh, Putin's opponent, uh, hence in jail at the moment of this conversation. Um, mm -hmm. but he was like, I remember for the first, couple of years of his like rise to prominence whenever he would be on uh, like some TV show. It was not like federal TV, but whenever he got some airtime or on radio or something, he would be, they would say, this is Alexei Navalny blogger, political blogger. Uh, so he, that's how he started. Um, there's not, I mean, I definitely don't uh, think about things I should or shouldn't say. Uh, you're free to say whatever you want, uh, unless you become big, right? right? And then, uh, and then you would have like the option of quieting down. But if you didn't subdue your message, then you might be in danger right. of getting arrested or something. Right. I think I think that's the case. But uh, though, at the same time, so you know, at the beginning of the conversation, I tried to make it sound good that the system is. Uh, um, wonky and works in weird ways. Sometimes it's, it works the other way around, right? So they currently, like uh, recently, uh, in, in the last, I don't know, three years, there was this new law against um, fascist or Nazi propaganda uh, that you're not, you're, you're not allowed. To, well, so the, the example I'm going to bring up is there was a, a lady who I think she got a fine. I think she, not a huge fine, but like 10,000 rubles or something for posting a picture of her own, uh, like the apartment building where she lives uh, that was taken during the Nazi occupation. So she just posted it on her profile in social media saying, whoa, this is my house. Look at it. It has a swastika uh, hanging from the side of the building. And uh, that was deemed Nazi propaganda and she got in trouble for that. So there is always like a chance of getting in trouble kind of randomly, right? She mm -hmm. didn't, she, she definitely didn't think she's breaking any laws when she posted that. Um, but in terms of actual prosecution, you would have to mean something to be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. And what about, um, the you know we hear about people being killed on the streets one guy was famously i think shot on a bridge mm -hmm. i think some journalists have some journalists been killed uh or, over I mean, the you years tell me. sure so you so what is the line i mean who's doing the killing uh i think in america the the assumption is it's kind of always putin uh, but i think sometimes the speculation is a little more complicated in russia itself with some of these people right yeah well i mean it's kind of anybody's guess in most of these cases um i think the general so like politkovskaya was a journalist who was uh famously killed uh, the guy you're referring to the guy who got killed on a bridge very close to the kremlin um but yeah. he's um the thought there 
I think like the most widely accepted theory, what they did wrong is they uh, uh, investigated crimes that took place in or are taking place in Chechnya. So that's that's the uh, that's a republic in the Caucasus that tried uh, to gain independence from Russia, which led to right. two wars. Uh, kind of a really very brutal suppression of a nationalist movement. I mean, I, I think Americans sometimes think of that as, you know, part of global jihadist terrorism because it, it is a Muslim area. But I think originally it was as much a, a nationalist as a religious revolt. Yeah, I think I uh, I would say it was mostly nationalist probably. It's, it's a complicated, yeah. I mean, as any war, it's a really complicated issue. Yeah. Um, as, yeah, we don't have to get it. That's just my little hobby horse and being careful about what, what we right, attribute right. to religion and what we don't. But, um, but so in any case, so anyway, so, so the thinking is that this one guy was killed by a uh, Chechnyan potentate or something. Right. So, so the, the way these conflicts ended is, uh, Chechnya is a part of Russia. Now the guy in charge of the Republic has basically absolute power within it. Uh, and he fought in the first Chechen war, he fought on the side of, of the separatist movement. Mm. So many people see it and, and Chechen gets a lot of money from, uh, the federal budget. So some Russians see it as like, it's presented as a victory. We, the, the Russian side won the che Chechen is, a, a, you know, part of the country. Some mm -hmm. Russians see it as a, a loss that is dressed up as victory because the guy who fought the original war is in power and can do whatever he wants. And it is like if there's one or two regions where Russians themselves would be afraid of going to, I don't know how, uh, I've never been to Chechnya. I don't know how uh, ba based in reality those like concerns and fears are, but this, it's definitely one of the regions where there's tension, people are uh, cautious of that. And, and there is definitely a lot of crime uh, like government supported crime there are there are assassinations there there are a few regions where in elections there's always like 99 percent voting for putin mm -hmm. chechnya is one of them the guess is it's not because people actually vote that way right mm -hmm. so so I, I i would think so like answering your question about how free you feel in russia or america i think in chechnya you definitely don't feel very free when it comes to political uh, uh, voice and political opinions, so the, so so Russia has just chosen to kind of outsource Chechnya to this this one guy uh, in exchange for him keeping it under control. They basically say you can do whatever you want. It's as if it's as if they let somebody in Wyoming set up a dictatorship because he had successfully kept some uh, you know renegades in line. Yep, I think I think that's right. And and then Kadyrov also uses every opportunity he can to uh, pledge his, his allegiance to Putin personally. There were some very bizarre uh, events. Like one time he just gathered, I, it, people were puzzled by that. It was not like clear what's going on. He just gathered like, I want to say thousands of armed people in a stadium, sort of like his personal army. Uh, mm -hmm. to proclaim that, uh, like, Vladimir Putin, just so you know, you have an army here. If you need us to fight some war, some place, just, you know, hmm. tell me we're here. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining the, the Trump equivalent of that, and it's making me uneasy. So let's, let's move on to something else. The, um, uh, so, I, I mean, uh, so first of all, when somebody gets killed, a journalist or something, it's not always clear who did it. I assume sometimes the speculation is that that Putin had it done. Yeah. And, and in any case, like, so, uh, for example, Nimtsov is the latest kind of big case, the, the guy who was killed on the bridge. So the mm -hmm. uh, there are real reasons to believe it was uh, connected to Kadyrov. Uh, I, I don't remember all the details now, but there were some people who... Uh, were uh, being questioned and whatnot, and then they were let free. There's definitely, in that case, um, on the side of 
the government, uh, it's a case that was not properly investigated. And mm -hmm. it was clear that nobody's going to go, like people who did it probably will not go to jail. And that's probably because uh, of the orders from the above, from Putin. Um, but okay. uh, the I think the the, the theory that is uh, spread the widest is Kadyrov did it seemingly without orders from Putin. Moreover, looks like Putin wouldn't want that to happen. Like it it didn't really help him in 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 large ways, and it did harm him. Um, but it's you know all of this is kind of speculation and kind of conspiratorial thinking in, mm -hmm. in a sense because the facts are not are not really there. Okay. And then what about, I mean, you mentioned that like the election results coming in from Chechnya should be viewed with some suspicion. Right. What about the elections? Um, what about say in, in Moscow, in other parts of Russia, to what extent is Putin entitled to, uh, you know, to take those kinds of results as some kind of mandates? I mean, traditionally there's kind of two ways uh, a, a, an authoritarian ruler can can work things in their favor. One is by actually rigging the results, you know, the ballot box. The other is by constraining, uh, you know, who can and cannot run against him. In this case, one of his rivals is in jail. Uh, of course, we don't have an election going on now, but 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 that that suggests one way to keep somebody from being ver a very effective rival. Well, what's what would you say about all that and uh, like the level of support for Putin? Uh, so of those two scenarios that you mentioned, Putin does a little bit of both. Um, there is rigging. I mean, there's you can go on YouTube and just search for ballot stuff in or something uh, in Russian elections and you'll see footage of that taking place. Um, how uh, uh, how different the results would be if that didn't take place is uh, kind of again uh, open to speculation. There are that people have done some research. So that one of the kind of parts of uh, let's say anti-Putin political movements is observing the elections. That according to the law, people can enlist in like independent to be an independent observer of the election to make sure that no rigging takes place and. You can compare the results in the spots where that was done rigorously and where it didn't happen at all, and there is a noticeable difference. That said, uh, he could, he would definitely win every election he participated in uh, without stuff in, stuff in the ballots uh, because the competition is not. So there is always competition. There are like these people who have been in every election since the time I was born. And they mm -hmm. play the opposition. They they all have la like varying levels of support. Like the Communist Party uh, can count on a certain percentage of votes from mostly older people. Um, uh, there is a guy who is, mm -hmm. when, when Trump was, was uh, you know, entered the, uh, the political sphere, most Russians recognized him immediately because we have a guy who's very similar to Trump and he's been on the political stage like throughout my lifetime. I don't remember a time when he was not on TV and he's still there. Difference, he was never, like he had like some noticeable support in the early 90s, like right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then he continued playing this role of opposition that definitely does not challenge uh, the regime and like he's not going to win any election, but he will take mm -hmm. his like five percent or whatever of people who are most frustrated or angry and want uh, um, the crazy person to be in charge. So wait, did you did did um did you say originally it seemed like Trump would play that role, or it um, he just he just like, behaves like very similar like to to like facial expressions and and the way he speaks and and the the uh, so you have to a kind of a clownish of... politician figure in Russia whose job is to be an ineffective that's right rival that's right yeah so but, there are, there are... but Trump surprised us and turned out to be yes. a, an effective yeah <laughs> uh, so um 
Just quickly, by the way, how is Trump? I mean, I know you can't generalize, but what are some perceptions of Trump in Russia? Um, I mean, in some ways, he's a very recognizable kind of figure, at least in America. He's thought of as doing taking things out of the authoritarian playbook, you know, doing the kinds of things, uh, you know, like just this this week, he uh, intervened in a, in a judicial investigation into him in ways that people thought was not, of course, in Russia, I, I think the judicial investigation would never have gotten off the ground in the first place. The, the idea that the Justice Department would, would, would announce it was investigating Putin is probably not too likely, right? right. But, yeah. um, but, but, but uh, what, what, anyway, are there any, uh, any surprise, uh, perceptions of, of Trump that might surprise Americans from Russia? Um. I don't know. Thinking of perception that that might surprise Americans. I remember when when he was running, some people said that he's gonna get killed because like physically killed, like like Kennedy was killed. Like he seemed like a oh. person outside of the uh, political establishment, and mm-hmm. the idea was, well, this thing is run pretty tightly. You're not allowed to just a random guy to 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 be like like that. Um, I think nowadays, I mean, it, you're right. It's difficult to, to generalize. Uh, I think people, like most often, I hear that he's viewed as a businessman running, not even the country, like running the country as a business, but also just running his own business empire mm-hmm. and using the presidential uh, uh, post to do that. I, I, I'd say more often than not, Russians don't focus on Trump personally. There is like. It's more like the Americans, right. you know, and it's like there was this when Oliver Stone did these interviews with Putin. There's a moment there when I don't remember when, whether it was like before Trump was elected or right after, but he asked Putin about. So on the campaign trail, Trump talked about warming up to Russia or wh- whatever. What do you think of that? And Putin had this uh, look on his face like I've been here for some time now. I I've dealt with Bush and I've dealt with. Uh, Obama, and now there's going to be Trump. People say things on the campaign trail because they need to be elected. It's not the president who actually runs the thing, though. It's the bureaucracy. Everywhere, you, whether it's Russia or America, mm-hmm. there's like the general system that runs things. And so what he says, we'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens. And I think that's the general perception uh, of of the people, too. Like, it's not Trump personally. It's the Americans who many people think they hate Russia, something they don't, but it's usually viewed as this one kind of like uh, collective entity. And what what do people think about this whole question of whether Russia colluded with Trump to help Trump win the election? <laughs> I remember when the first uh, reports started coming out of the Russian hackers and the Russian trolls and whatnot. That was met with uh, with amusement. Um, partly, Why? well, partly because, like, the feeling that um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, from the general feeling of living in Russia and, and and seeing the events in the in the world take place, and from actual like speeches by Western politicians, we had the feeling that we're a peripheral power, if if a power at all, inconsequential. Uh, you know, the, the the country is not is not strong enough. And then suddenly, we decided the outcome of the American election, and that like that change happened overnight, and it felt like well, you, you got to pick one narrative out of those two. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one part. The other part is I did the. the so there are many sides to this Russian Trump thing, right? There, if we're talking about the um, sway in the political, the, the opinion of the public in on Facebook and things like that, that is, uh, I think, rightly viewed uh, as kind of ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, partly because it's like, like so we had some. Even if even if all those things that people say took place, 
if they did take place. Uh, that's not enough to undermine a working democracy, a working system. Moreover, like things are, there are a lot of fake things on the internet. I, I will not uh, believe that Putin is the first guy to invent the idea that you can pretend to be somebody else on Facebook, right? Um, I, the other thing is, I, I think I told you that story. I actually met a guy who worked at that, uh, that building that's called, still works, I think, called uh, uh, informally the Troll Factory. So the people who were employed with. Right. Well, there's a name. It's some sort of internet something. I think it was actually named in an indictment. I don't know that they were indicted, but, but I think it was mentioned in, in one of the Mueller indictments, maybe. The, the, the Internet something agency or something. Anyway, yeah. these, this is the group that, that supposedly, you know, was at the center of this uh, effort to, like, manipulate social media uh, to Trump's advantage. So anyway, yeah, you talked to somebody from that? Yeah, so I, I, I met a guy who... Uh at least at the time when I would talk to him, still was employed there. And, you know, I was curious, I asked him, so what did you do? How did it feel? Uh, tell me about it. And he was like, man, it's, there's nothing to talk about. I was, he led a group on Facebook that was targeting Texans. And his big success that uh, he was praised for by the bosses was he posted, I think, a picture of a steak uh, and wrote that steak. Like a steak you eat. Like. Yeah, yeah. So he 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 never posted anything political. He posted pictures of guns and steaks and flags and just like Texan stuff, things that people in Texas enjoy. <laughs> guns, steaks, and the Texas flag or the American <laughs> flag. Yeah, that's about it. And, uh, and, and so because because he is what he the the metric that he was his performance was judged by is how many people like and share the thing. And so his big success was this picture of a steak that got shared and like a lot. And his boss was very pleased with that because then the boss could report to his boss that we influenced these tens of thousands of Americans who liked and shared our posts. So his boss just wanted to generate numbers and didn't care how they were generated. Uh, and so as a result, it was perhaps a much less uh, effective effort than we we might have been led to believe that's <laughs> they right were, yeah they, they were actually so at least from their point of view a certain number a, amount of the traffic numbers they were generating and were supposed to be generating to subvert the american political system they were actually generating in ways that led people to eat more steak right right or or be <laughs> happier about the steaks that they eat or something i don't know if there's a word in english there's a word in russian that refers to this it, 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 encapsulates what 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 that uh, uh entity was doing and it's like there's a word that means to steal the budget money by pretending to do some meaningful work right so that that's what they're doing you you have a mm -hmm. a, a mission to uh spread propaganda on the internet how do we measure that likes and shares Okay, so we'll figure out a way to do as little work as possible to deliver the numbers so we get paid the salary that we were promised. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. Um, so, uh, so you said your grandmother supports Putin. What does that mean? What does it mean to support? In what sense does she support him? Why does she support him? Right. That's a, that's a good question. That's, uh, uh, that's one of the things, like, I, I when I lived in America, people would either ask me whether whether it's true that most Russians support Putin or tell me that, you know, you can criticize him all you want, but most Russians I know support Putin. And my point always was that the, it means different things to support, uh, you know, the president in Russia and in America. So when American says, I support Donald Trump, what they mean is something like... Um, I am probably going to vote for him in the next election where he will be competing with a different person, right? In Russia, when you say I support Putin, you mean I do not want a regime change because Putin does not need you to vote. He'll, he'll, he's fine. He's not, he's not in danger of losing an election anytime soon. Uh, so supporting Putin is 
not going into the streets protesting against him. It's more like that. And there's also reason for the majority of Russians to not want a regime change because the country's history knows regime changes. Uh, you know, the 20th century alone had three at the very least, right? We had the February of 1917, then October of 1917, and then 1991 when the country collapsed. And all of these events are, you know, controversial. There are always people who think that's the best thing that ever happened in this country. And there are people who think that's the worst thing that ever happened in the country. But everybody agrees that all of them caused a lot of chaos and poverty and crime. And in one case, a civil war. And, um, you know, nobody looks, I mean, some people do look at the 90s fondly because it was a freer time, but it was also um, like that. That's one of the stronger points of Putin's propaganda. You don't want the return to the 90s. You don't because want, there was an economic crisis, economic crisis, incredible poverty, crime, drug problems. Like I talked to my friend uh, recently to, you know, I was born in 1988. So that's three years before the collapse of the Soviet Union. I was talking to a girl my age and we were just reminiscing of, about childhood and thinking of like symbols of childhood, like certain bubble gums or cartoons that we watched and things like that. And we were surprised to find out that we both thought that in that list of symbols of like objects that we think of when we think growing up in the 90s, there were syringes that were uh, always found in the streets because heroin was a mm. thing. And mm. you don't find mm. syringes, at least not in Moscow or St. Petersburg. They're not at least as, as prevalent as they were when they were li when we were living. And that's because tighter law enforcement or just because things aren't as bad? I think it's just time, things like mm -hmm. economically, things are not yeah. as bad. And it's also... Uh, epidemics do pass. Yeah. I mean, drug epidemics subside. They don't go away yeah. completely. I mean, I also don't want to say that there are no drug epidemics in Russia now. Uh, part of it, like the, the syringes exa example is like first person account. Mm -hmm. Like we saw those syringes in school and whatnot. But uh, a big part of the perception of how things are come from the media and mm -hmm. the media in the nineties was free. And you like, if horrible things were happening, you would know about them while now you might not be aware of, uh, you know, a drug epidemic in some, uh, city in the yeah. Ural mountains. So, um, you know, I mean, one thing Westerners might say is, you know, the Russian economy hasn't been doing well lately. How does Putin remain in power? It sounds like there's, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, to the extent that his remaining is a result of popular sentiment, which isn't the only way, of course, uh, an authoritarian can remain in power. But but um, to the extent that there is popular support, it sounds like there's a couple of things. First of all, there's very recent memory of much worse economic times. True. Uh, and uh, fear that uh, regime change could perhaps lead to those, especially in light of the second thing, which is just against a longer backdrop a history of kind of repeated chaos or, 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 or um, historically. So there's kind of a fear of chaos that's maybe uh, ingrained in a long-term way in the culture and, and a, a, a recent memory of econo utter complete economic collapse. I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, the 20th century, like if you just take a look at the, you know, you have the, First World War, then you have one revolution, then you have another revolution, then after that, the 30s, the Stalin purges, where a lot of people died for no apparent, or were exiled for no apparent reason. Then the Second World War, which is very different for Russians than it is for, let's say, Americans, because I think the estimates of, of the death toll by the Soviet Union is like uh, 20 million or more. So that, which means like everybody, like if you just stand outside, uh, you know, in, in, in the square in, in St. Petersburg, everybody you'll see in the street have lost somebody in that war. So that alone is just like the, the it makes people think that suffering can 
just suddenly happened on massive scale uh, and you can't do anything about it. And mm-hmm. revolutions are a, in a similar thing. It's like, it's just sometimes a historic event happens and then chaos ensues. And, and most people anywhere in the world, I think, would be you know, not very excited about the prospects mm-hmm. like that. And so the 90s also, I mean, some people are, are happy about it. Some people are not. At the, I mean, the fall of the Soviet empire. But uh, yeah, the, the economic collapse was very, was felt by everybody. And, and so there is a general feeling that whatever is happening now, it could get way worse. There's a, <laughs> I saw somewhere like, I think it was like a post on Reddit asking people to um, describe the history of their country in two words or three words. And the Russian, the, the answer that got upvoted the most for Russian history is, and then it got worse. And that's mm-hmm. kind of a feeling that people have. Whatever we have now, it may get way worse. And when you, when somebody, so again, Putin's support what would it mean for what are the scenarios for Putin to go away? He's not going to like lose an election to uh, a, some reasonable opponent. Mm-hmm. He might lose power due to some sort of a revolution. There might be some sort of a coup uh, or there might be a, a peaceful transfer of power that he himself would initiate uh, which doesn't seem likely. Um, the scenario where he leaves because somebody, because people went into the streets and forced him to leave, uh, what happens after that, nobody knows. And mm-hmm. the history of the country suggests that it's probably not going to be easy on the population. So do most, do most Russians, in your view, support Putin in the sense that your grandmother does? I'd say so. I'd say that's that's yeah. correct, yeah. So, um, but and the last again, question about that is, well, go ahead. I was just saying that if there was an election where he was uh, really competing with uh, an alternative that can win, mm-hmm. then the word support would change its meaning. And uh, in that context, I think it's not difficult to imagine uh, that support plumbing completely. Plummeting. Plummeting, yeah. Um, so uh, last question about Putin's support. How much, if any of it, derives from the sense of kind of lost greatness? Like we were once the mighty Soviet Union. Putin is strong. He He kind of, you know, he throws around his weight on the international stage and so on. I mean, not to mention a longer term sense of tradition and, uh, well, not to mention themes of like kind of, you know, Christian nationalism. I mean, it's ironic. I mean, on the one hand, you got the Soviet Union, right? On the other hand, you hear about a revival of a uh, a kind of Christian nationalism of the sort that was actually suppressed during the Soviet days, uh, which he somewhat appeals to as well, right? Well, the Christian thing is, uh, it's a whole different conversation because religiosity is also different in Russia and in America. And yeah. my favorite, one of my, the favorite, one of my most favorite pieces of data ever was this poll where uh, they asked Russians whether they consider themselves Christian Orthodox. That's like the Russian mm-hmm. Orthodox, Eastern Christianity, let's say. Um, and 70%, it, it's fairly recent, like maybe five years ago. Uh, and 70% said they do consider themselves Russian Orthodox. And then 30% of those said they do not believe in God, <laughs> right? So yeah, that is that is different. So from, so, from... so it would it, it would suggest that when you say I'm Christian in Russia, and I, I know that from personal uh, accounts too, like I've talked to especially people like of um, my parents' generation, let's say, mm-hmm. they could say, yeah, I'm an atheist. I'm also Orthodox Christian. Uh, and so for them, it means I'm like the default Russian, uh, you know, if, if you're asking my views on religion, I'm the default option. Mm-hmm. Right. And what about 
what about the sense of this sense of past Soviet greatness? Does that feed into it? That's definitely part of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, is there anything value of value to say there? Um, well, Crimea was his big, what's that? Crimea was his big right thing that gained him a lot of support with some people and then also divided the country very sharply. Uh, but for a lot of people, yeah, it's like re reunification right. of, of, uh, of, of the country. We got our region back. And, uh, I mean, it just generally, like if you're, if you're looking at it, if you're in school studying the history of the country, there are periods where it amasses territory. There are periods where it loses territory. Once the first is associated with the country's doing well and is on its way to greatness, losing territory doesn't, it doesn't look appealing. Right. So, and of course, Crimea is funny because, uh, until I think the fifties, it wasn't just part of the Soviet Union. It was part of Russia within the Soviet Union. Right. That's right. And so there was a particular, very large, uh, Russian, you know, most of the people in Crimea, I think wanted, uh, Russia to, well, they're uh, Russians answer. and they speak Russian. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so, um, on that, just quickly, there is the view in, in America of some people that like expanding NATO like up to Russia's borders and things like fiddling, well, from the doing some sort of encouragement of in the Ukrainian election of people that Putin did not favor, like all of that, uh, there is a view that that kind of thing was a mistake precisely because it makes uh, Russians feel threatened. I don't know how much Russians per se pay attention to it, but but uh, that, that it, it, it makes Putin kind of need to lash out or need to assert himself in reaction to that sense of threat. I don't know about the need to assert himself, but it definitely helps him. Uh, like it's always nice to have an enemy, mm-hmm. right? And uh, in Putin's case, it's not difficult to point to. Yeah, NATO bases are all around the country. That there is, I don't know. It, it, people dispute how real that is but uh, apparently it was promised to gorbachev uh, during the berlin war I, I, I think we did make an informal promise that we would not right. incorporate eastern european countries into nato and i think we broke that promise yeah. but but it wasn't in, in writing i think I, I think it wasn't in writing but i right. think it, there's no doubt that it was said so so yeah definitely i mean i mean it's not it's not difficult to see america as an empire that is trying to control the world because mm-hmm. i mean isn't that the case <laughs> um, you have a point there, mind you. but um, the uh, uh, um, I, I want to uh, in closing kind of just show this picture of you because you were also you were at this like uh, avant garde demonstration that I think I alluded to where you did this like kind of absurdist thing. I got to wait for Windows to recognize my face. Uh, Aren't you just scared of that? Uh, like teaching devices to recognize your face. Um, there's scarier things. Uh, I'm trying to think how I feel about that. Uh, um, no, well, no, I worry more about just the fact that someone could be commandeering my camera to spy on me. Right. Um, so anyway, like here you are, let me try to hold this up to the camera in an effective, whoa. Uh, this damn, I I won't go into my frustrations with my, this kind of computer, but can you see yourself there? I can. Yeah. Okay. Wait, but, but the edges of this may get cut off. Are you there in the middle now? I, I'm in the middle of the the screen, screen, but I'm in at the edge of the, of the, right. right. So you're there in the middle of the screen or on the edge of my computer screen. Yeah. So what's the deal with these signs? What do they say? And, uh. What's the point? All those would be. And by the way, this was like in a real like what? Isn't the outline like a serious website or? or... You're famous now, right? Yeah, this I, is like I, not I, some like little bullshit picture you put up. Yeah, no, that's a that's some Western magazine that I've seen right before. Uh, I don't know much about it though. Yeah. So what what were you doing with these signs? Well, that's that's kind of the gets back to my hobby horse of of, of pointing out how difficult it is to understand um, a different country's culture. Um, like that article, I thought 
misrepresented the thing completely. So the, the, the headline of that article was something like, young Russians are using nonsensical slogans to protest internet censorship or something like that. Um, and so the, the article is about this um, uh, new peculiar tradition that is 15 years old now, I think. It started in Siberia, in the city of Novosibirsk. Uh, it's called Monstration, like demonstration, but without the first syllable. And it looks like a political rally. People are marching down the street, carrying slogans and chanting things. Uh, the def- It takes place on May 1st, which was uh, this huge... Uh, holiday for the Soviet regime, right? The Labor Day. Um, mm-hmm. It's still a holiday and people still march down the streets, but it, it is devoid of the ideological kind of meaning now. Um, and so it looks like a political demonstration. The difference is all these slogans and chants and whatnot make no sense or very little sense. And it's like humorous or absurdist or whatever. And I think, I mean, I don't know, of course, why the journalist wrote it um, the way he did, I think it's an honest misunderstanding. I think he thinks, well, if you are going to join some demonstration and risk a fine or imprisonment or something, it must be for some important cause and protest. And I mean, there were a few signs uh, that jokingly alluded to political events Mm -hmm. because you can't, I mean, for these signs to not be there, you would have to actively censor them. Mm -hmm. Politics is a part of life. But, but it's, it, I thought it's like for an outside observer, it seems that it must be about something important like political demands can't be just about the absurd. And I think for the Russians, it's kind of the other way. Like the absurd is imper- important for the Russian psyche. The investigation of the absurd is important and the ability to do something that doesn't fit any category to puzzle the police or puzzle the authorities Mm -hmm. uh, or puzzle fellow Russians or the older generation or whatever. Those things are a goal in, in themselves. And, and how should I say it? It's like, it's like rock and roll didn't have to be overtly political to be an explosive force. Right. Well, I was going to ask you, to what extent was this artistic expression and to what extent was it political expression? Well, that's kind of for, for the observer or the participant to decide. Most like some people, I know that people participating in this kind of thing, some think it's, I don't know, meta politics. It's political without being uh, being um, particular about uh, the events of, of the day. It's like a way of saying this whole political landscape in Russia is bullshit. For some, it's that. For some, it's a mockery of political demonstrations, right? You can say, uh, like, Navalny calls people to go into the streets and demand that Putin goes away. Well, you've done this a few times now. Putin doesn't seem to be going away. Uh, are you so sure? What did you... Yeah. So are you sure no, that, that, that making these kinds of demands is more meaningful than just having fun and, mm. and marching down the street? And that itself is in a way a mockery of this system because you're saying in this system, expressing popular will doesn't get you very far. Right. Am yeah. I reading too much the, into it? In the in the in that one that I took part in uh, this May, there was one girl that got detained. She was mm-hmm. represent. She was not. Uh, there was like apart from the, the the way it happened is on May first there are all kinds of um, political forces that engaged in this like traditional demonstration you you had anarchists and then after those the stalinists and then after Mm -hmm. those somebody else and in those people who it actually like we we had stalinist marching behind us and it was confusing which part is the more absurd people carrying actual portraits of stalin in 2018 some of them arguing that he should be recognized as an orthodox saint uh or this you know young crowd mm-hmm. with with nonsensical slogans uh, but there was one girl who got detained she was in front of the like apart from the demonstration crowd there was some people dressed up as dead people and they were calling themselves the party of the dead with slogans mm-hmm. like we are your future or uh their whole shtick is like 
the dead have been uh, unrepresented for too long. There are more of us than there are of you. This kind of theater, which I don't know much about, like what their deal is. But this one girl was arrested because she had a poster with like stages of Putin's, uh, what do you call it? Degradation, like stages that you had a picture. Decline or, yeah. Like uh, degradation in the sense of the corpse. Oh, 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 decomposition. Decomposition, yeah. Yeah. And it was curious to watch because the first, like one policeman approached her and he was like, is this an absurd something going on here or is this a political thing? And then a different, so they had like a little console of policemen in the street and I think one military person arrived who had the most uh, willingness to make a decision. And he's like, just take her. And so she, <laughs> she got the reason. But that like to point to this blurry line between mm. free expression of we don't even know what exactly to political expression and how this should be uh, or not should be, but how it is perceived and reacted against. I think that that's the kind of like thing that ex- this kind of thing explores. And what did what did your sign say? The sign you were holding. Uh, so I, in that picture, I'm with a friend of mine, and we both hold signs with words from an old song from the '80s, kind of absurd song as well. And uh, she is holding a sign that says "Super Patience," and I'm holding a sign that says "Trans Reliability." It almost doesn't matter what they mean. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Final question. You uh, you don't remember the 80s or the 70s because mm-hmm. you weren't around for most of the 80s or any of the 70s. But from what you've heard, do you have more freedom than people had then? Oh, yeah. Yeah, on the uh, Late 80s, like starting with Perestroika, that's arguable because there was, but it is difficult, right? It's like that, that was a transition from a very rigid system to a more open one. And it's like mm-hmm. a spectrum. Um, things were opening up and I think it, it feels differently when feel like you can, mm-hmm. if you compare two points and in the two points, the level of freedom is the same, but one is on the, uh, like it, it increase and the other is on the decline. It feels differently. So late eighties uh, is kind of you can argue, um, but uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Now there is more free. You can do kind of whatever you want until you run into a particular problem. Mm-hmm. You know, and even, and even then, you may be able to buy your way out of it. That's that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks. I wish we had more time, but uh, uh, I should wrap it up for a number of reasons uh, having to do with a dentist appointment I have and other things. Um, uh, So thanks. And uh, like I said, people can see some of your work on, uh, I guess, more on Meaning of Life TV than Blogging Heads. Any other, uh, we mentioned Tony Ortega, anybody else you would have them uh, search for on YouTube that you've had a conversation with? Um, if the Russian topics are interesting to the people, I've done two interviews with uh, George Young, who wrote a book about a very peculiar, strange train of thought in Russian philosophy called Russian Cosmism. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's that's I, I thought those were interesting and and very kind of mm-hmm. out there. And then where else? You want to mention a Twitter feed or anything? Where else can people find your stuff? Uh, my Twitter feed is in Russian, so I don't think there's a point. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks, Nikita. We will definitely be uh, talking to each other soon. Okay. Thanks. All right.